Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. Hi there, welcome to episode 64 of the Kiwi Mana Beekeeping Podcast, the number one beekeeping podcast in New Zealand and heard all over the world. Thanks for coming. This week we are talking about bee products, neonic suit, and beekeeping and mental health. Mental health. I do. The question is, episode 64, so when I get old, will you still feed me, Margaret? And will you still need me <laughs> when I'm 64? <laughs> That's it. Back to business. Welcome. Back to business. Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. Hi, I'm Gary, and that's yeah. Margaret. Hi. And we are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges in West Auckland, New Zealand. And our podcast is about beekeeping, gardening, and political issues. Sometimes, quite a lot recently, and we have been known to go off on tangents and discuss other issues. And the show notes for this podcast are... KiwiMana.co.nz forward slash 64. That's right. And thank you today for you listening. I really appreciate you coming along today. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's been awesome. And we're getting a lot of feedback from you guys. So keep it coming. So it's awesome. Yep, absolutely. And thanks for having downloaded our last podcast. It's been great. And, yeah, it's um, been awesome. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Everything is awesome. Everything is awesome. <laughs> What's happening at Kiwi Mana? Well, we got a we got a really nice postcard today for all the way from Switzerland. Yeah, it from was Andreas. great. From Andreas. It was yeah. fantastic. Thank you, Andreas, for sending that. Andreas was the winner of the Manuka Honey Book that we did on the uh, Cliff Van Eaton podcast. Yeah, the competition, and he um, is very grateful for it. And the postcard is awesome. You should see the landscape. We're going to put a picture of that on the... Um, show notes so you can have a look at that guys and uh, enjoy because that's what his bees wake up to when they get out of their winter slumber. Absolutely and Switzerland is a beautiful country isn't it? We must must go there one day. Indeed, indeed we must. And I've been inspecting the hives and the bees are filling up the boxes and they're going crazy so it's been great. I've been adding boxes like no one's business. Extracted a um, frame of honey didn't we? Yep, we're working on um, extracting more. We're trying to, we're trying to let them build up their own winter stores, but it's been awesome. Although the sis, the season did start really late, they are really making up for it in uh, leaps and bounds. And you were saying so, the other day that it might be going longer than February. Yes, I was listening to some weather forecasters, and they were saying that this season seems to be looking to stay quite warm. And probably till the end of March. So that's an interesting forecast. We'll have to see if that actually happens. Absolutely, because it'll uh, affect our uh, treatments and stuff, won't it? Yeah, and our water tank. Yeah, that's just about empty, isn't it? (laughs) And the uh, wax moths are having fun in our shed, aren't they? Oh, party time, party time in the shed. They're so frustrating, Yeah, yeah. You, you put pack them away um, at the end of the season, last season. You think, oh, they'll all be fine. And then you come along and they've all been eaten by wax moss. How are they getting into the boxes? Yeah, I think we have to lift our game. I think that's really important. And we have some insect meshes that we put on the boxes, but we didn't put them on all of them. So the minute there's a crack there, they come in. The worst one is the larger wax moth which has caused quite a bit of damage. But we're giving the most of the girls new comb this year, so I think we won't have as major a problem. And I'm going to make some more mesh covers, so that should protect them a bit more. Absolutely. And we had one, um, a swarm that we picked up a few weeks ago, had obs- absconded. There was nothing left except for wax moths. Oh, you're talking about the Kiwimana... Uh, quarantine apri from the other apri yeah, yeah they yeah. Uh, they just taken off there was nothing left no one was home and i pulled out a frame and there was five wax moths sitting on the frame <laughs> preparing are. to yeah. eat it so we must so what if you do get that the best thing to do is freeze those frames in the freezer if you can and for 24 hours and then make sure they're sealed up so they don't get uh, eaten by wax moths or if you're going to put them on another hive just throw them in another hive after they've defrosted a bit, you don't want to put cold frames in a hive. 
Do you, Dal? No, you might chill your bees. But um, if you're going to do that, um, store your frames. There's different ways you can do it, and um, our recommendation is is that keep them in an insect uh, mesh type container so nothing can get in. That we saw one lady who actually just t- hangs them all up in the shed, open to the elements. So that was interesting. Yeah, that was Karen Bean from uh, near up by Seattle and Washington State. So that that's a good idea, eh? Yeah, was, just describe what she does. She has them. She has like some um, strips and stuff, and she hangs your frames at the top of her shed, just hanging in the roof area, just you know, with a bit of space between them. Yeah. Because the worst thing to do, I've heard from other people, is you never put your frames in a ten frame box. You put them. You only put like seven in it, so you give a big gap between the frames because then you you're creating like a, a, a like a bigger gap. So there's lot there a lot uh, don't appreciate the. Uh, big gap they like nice cozy frames all stuffed together okay so you're saying you need to create some sort of air space yep and okay. uh, if you can have some air flowing through the boxes that's even better i think it's interesting because we have the two here we have the big big one that's a real awful one to to see what they do and then we've got the the smaller one which seems to quietly go about its business and sometimes isn't always picked up but I've seen them actually flying a lot around the apiary so I think one of the cautionary tales is that you keep all your frames inside you don't leave them outside you keep them covered when you're transporting them so that there's no risk of being open to the wax moth If you're taking it um, to the next spot and you know there's wax moth in there, you really can't put it in a weak colony because that colony will um, not be able to deal with it. So, yeah, Gary's advice about putting them in the freezer is one of the steps you can take. Absolutely. And... You want to talk about monarchs and paper wasps? Are they they good friends together? Yeah, that's what's happening at Kiwi Mana HQ for me. Um, One of my new beginners has got um, some swan plants at her property and we went there and I was helping her with the bees and trying to get all the bees um, sorted out. And then after that we had a nice cup of tea. and Any chocolate biscuits? No chocolate biscuits. But anyway. The healthy stuff continues. (laughs) Yeah. They had a little wild garden to the side of the house and it's it's just really awesome. And um, next to that wild garden was the swan plant. And so they gave me some monarch caterpillars. So I took them home and unbeknownst to me, while I was out shopping because I had to leave them in the car because I was on the way home. Anyway, they were crawling around the whole car and one of them climbed into my gumboot and set itself into a chrysalis in my gumboot. And I didn't <laughs> I didn't find it till I was going to do some beekeeper services. And, um, and you stood on it? Well, I put my foot into the gumboot and felt this funny thing in there and, and quickly pulled my foot out and then I reached in and there it was so I've got it um, with another chrysalis so hopefully it hatches but uh, the other side of that is one of them was attacked by a paper wasp and it actually has just pulled the guts out of the chrysalis and it just was awful so I had to put them into a different place so that they wouldn't get attacked and so far so good but get rid of those paper wasps. I never used to worry about them, but now that I've seen what they can do, get rid of them. Yeah, they don't tend to bother bees, eh? But they they do they do like eating monarch butterflies. So yeah, mm. and monarch butterflies, from what I understand, are currently registered overseas as being under threat. So you know, if you guys can have a few swamp plants and and keep some aside, then yeah, do that and help our monarchs rebuild. Absolutely, and you've been called to talk at a, at a bylaw hearing? Yes, the Auckland Council have sent me an email to say that they are the hearings panel are now going to be listening to submissions for the bylaw for um, introducing a bee control measure in their bylaws. And um, 
I don't support it. I think that the nuisance bylaw, which has been in place for many, many, many years, is sufficient. And the my issues are is that they haven't got any resources to help us manage that air anyway. And um, yeah, I'll be making my points pretty clear and hope that they will support beekeepers to have bees in Auckland without any restriction and support um, urban beekeeping and not put restrictions on it and also I think it's going to be um, corresponding with the submissions that were made to the Auckland Unitary Plan. So if you guys have put in a submission and you said you want to speak, yeah, you can get in touch with me or Gary and just contact us and maybe we could all do something together and yeah put a presentation to prove that you know beekeeping is very important and valuable and that to restrict it in any way is just not productive so yeah absolutely and speaking of not productive is uh, drought at the moment isn't they in New Zealand yeah so um yeah just a final word on the bylaw don't say, don't do nothing. Go there and make your voice heard. Have your say and be heard. Get that? Be heard? Yep, I get it. Be heard? Okay. And uh, anyway, yeah, so go there, be heard and speak to your submissions so that they know that we want bees in Auckland City, all over Auckland City, and that will help the populations rebuild. Absolutely. And the drought situation, well, we nearly ran out of water the other day and then all of a sudden the clouds just came over, grey clouds, dark clouds, and they just let rip and we had the most amazing downpour, which was fantastic. So I was out dancing in the rain. It was fantastic. (laughs) And, yeah, I put the dishwasher on because... we were very worried about, you know, not having enough water. So that all went through really well. And now we have some clean dishes. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. And some water. And, and if you, if you have some, there's some late swarming going on as well, are you were saying? Yes, I've been getting a lot of calls about um, beekeepers that are having a colony that's not performing or they're having late swarming and so I've been called in to do a beekeeper service and what I'm finding is that these are beginner beekeepers and they just don't understand at this point that the bees population has increased incredibly and the reason they do that is because they need as many bees to be there so that they can um, go and forage and get the stores for the winter feeding so that that helps the hive survive winter so a lot of them aren't giving the bees enough room for their honey stores so the the hives are actually not swarming because they want to swarm they're actually swarming in the sense of absconding because there's just no room for them to have brood in the honey bound boxes so if you are noticing that your bees are just absolutely chocker then you need to add boxes on. And, you know, it's very important for you to realise that this is necessary in this season with the honey flow being so um, heavy. Make the most of it because then you have some good stores for them over winter. So, uh, yeah, space. Give them space to put the honey in. Yep. They've got to have room to move because I, I noticed sort of hive on the weekend that uh, they were like putting honey in the middle of the brood frame, so that's really bad. So you've got to yeah, make and, sure they've yeah. got empty frames to the edges of the brood and give it, give the queen space. And you, you'll you notice that in, when you're inspecting your brood that every where there's a space, if there's nectar in between the brood and there's a nectar cell and then a, a few gaps and then another nectar cell and there's you know, brood in the middle of all that, that means there is just not enough room. So you have to, you know, manage the honey frames up and create space below in the brood box so that they don't um, abscond. Because if they abscond, you will lose your hive even before winter started. That's right. And I had an inquiry the day about, is it too late to split a hive? And this person was in the Bay of Plenty. I'll have to get back to them. 
but it all depends on what the source is. We were talking about this the other day, weren't we? Yeah. When um, is it Gilbert came over? Remember? Yeah, and I think it's. Yeah. I think interestingly, at the moment, the late splits, because because our season was quite slow here where we are, some of the late splits are really slow. Um, some of them have done really well. The ones that are really slow, um, I don't really know why they are that way, but I just have um, had a look at them today and they are building up now. So if the season goes longer and if the honey flow carries on, then I'm hoping that will be enough to bring them to strength. strength. Yeah, that's the word. For winter, the um, another question was is that with the late split, the colony didn't build up enough. So what you can do is if you have a second colony that's doing really well, which is could could have been the original queen if you kept her, then you can um, as long as their population is well, you could always take a, a frame of older cat brood. And put that into that colony to just give it a bit of a, a boost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and if the worst scenario, you could you could possibly feed them later late in the season if there's not enough food for them. But or if try to avoid that if you can. Yeah, if the queen is not doing the right things, you might want to join the two colonies together because the last thing you want is to lose it. At least have one really really strong colony going into winter. Absolutely, because you want a, a strong colony that's got hardly any mites. That's that's the, your dream. Yeah, and I think that feeding well, that's your at, goal, I should say. Yeah, I think feeding at the moment isn't really necessary. If you've got honey on the on the in the colonies, then just take that and and prick some of the cells, and the bees will feed off that anyway. So, just do that without needing to sugar feed because the the flow is so big at the moment, especially where we are, just use that new honey stores. Yeah, exactly. I mean no what I'm what I was saying is that if if it's near the end of the season and the splits haven't got enough honey, you could feed them then if there's no flow on. But at the moment there's heaps of stuff going on, isn't there? Yeah, I think um I think if it's really that bad then I think you should think about knocking the queen on the head. I mean I don't like to say that at all and it's usually a very last uh decision but um yeah yeah well, we've got a hive at the other apiary that it was a originally it was a swarm but the swarm was literally about the size of a a, a, a man's fist it was very small and they've, they've gradually built up to two frames of brood it's taken them a mu- about two months to get that point and they don't seem to be going any further than that so yeah. i don't know what to do with those guys i i've been giving them feed and i've been keeping you know keeping them going and yeah it sounds to me like you need to just um, call it quits. And I had the same with the top bar. The top bar, we put some eggs in it, um, which I thought, you know, they would embrace. But instead, they had a laying worker in there, and she's just laying drones. So they're, they haven't done any good at all. So it was kind of my hope that they would you know, rise above it, but uh, the laying worker must have already uh, made her decision and the colony supported her. Tiny colony that it was, but uh, at the moment, yeah, they, they've failed. So these things happen. They do. They do. So what's next? Oh, what's next? Well, bearing in mind that a lot of people are looking at taking their honey off because it's been later on in the season there are risks with it if you do comb honey your risk is higher and that risk at this point in time is toxin poisoning from the tutu bush so it's it's a it's something that you need to be aware of at this time of the year with the circumstance of drought and the, the vine hopper is very prolific at the moment and there's a lot there could be bees that are hungry because I have noticed some robbing behavior at one of the hives so you may look at testing your honey your local bee club should be able to help you with that they often send in um, samples to be tested and you can do it at a cheaper price together so check out your local bee club for that 
Apart yep. from that, I would I would actually not take the honey off for your own consumption. I would keep the honey stores for the bees, ensure that they have a box on the top that's all theirs, and then after that, um, the rest is yours. But uh, treatment is the other thing that's coming up next, and monitoring your mite levels. I always talk about monitoring mite levels because I think it's really important because it can change really quickly. So, absolutely, treatments that's... in New Zealand would probably be relevant for uh, mid. February to the end of March so once you get all that done you want to reduce your entrances and maybe put up a wasp guard before the end of the season because that time of the year the wasps will start building up and they'll be looking for protein and they'll hunt bees. Yes they will we, we actually watched an interesting documentary last night about the Japanese giant hornet that was quite interesting eh, the way they uh, attack the honeybees. Yeah, I think it just shows you how horrible and nasty they are and they don't really seem to do any good. No. No, that was about a, a guy that was a Buddhist and he, he had honeybees and he also had a hornet nest on his property but he didn't, because he was a Buddhist, he didn't want to kill either, um, you know, the, the hornets. It was, so he was trying to let them live together and try and be with in nature but it didn't turn out so well for one hive, did it? Yeah, I think that's probably the balance is, is that if the hornets, they they had the hives that were um, sort of domesticated, as it were, and had been kept bees by a commercial guy, and they, they actually didn't respond very well. They were European bees, and they that hive died. But the ones that the Buddhist had which was a wild hive that just came to them, oh. that one just hammered those hornets. So, you know, it just shows oh, you right. it shows you the balance between him letting nature do its thing and they actually killed the hornets. And that was just amazing. And they, they did washboarding as well because when the hornet landed on the front of the hive, it put a scent out there. And after they basically heated this hornet up, it died. And then they went out and they were washboarding the front of the hive and the um, beekeeper pulled the hornet out of the hive. But it was just amazing to see them at work. They knew that the weakest thing for a hornet is to be overheated. Yeah, that was interesting. Because remember we had an interview with James in Japan and you were telling us, telling us all about that. That was really fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that the Buddhist idea of, of letting everything take nature take its course is actually showed in this documentary that, uh, you know, the bees that we have are going to do the same with Varroa. They're going to slowly develop behaviours that are going to overcome it. And all those surviving hives each season, they're going to get stronger and stronger. Yep. Absolutely. Well, that's the hope of it, eh? Absolutely. Let's move on to blog recap. Blog recap. This is where we recap the top three blogs from last month. Number one, Randy Oliver from Scientific Beekeeping. This is an interview that I did with Randy Oliver and from the website Scientific Beekeeping. That was an interesting conversation and yeah. has been very popular eh, around the world. Absolutely, and Randy has some interesting you know, uh, ways of doing things and managing bees, and yeah, he had some really valuable stuff to say, and also there was a lot of stuff there that was considered controversial, and um, everyone will have a view about that, but... You know, at the end of the day, we just have to keep making decisions based on our consumer dollar. I think that we need to be stronger in what we buy. Exactly, exactly. If we don't buy it, then they won't produce that stuff. Well, if they haven't got customers, they won't be around. Exactly. So, you know, I think when you're buying something, it will, regardless of what it is, if it creates rubbish, pollution, whatever really think carefully about that money you're spending and, and can you do without it, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, politically. Exactly. Environmentally concerned. Indeed. 
And our next most popular blog post was Beekeeping-101, which is my article I wrote about the seven steps to becoming a beekeeper. So it looks like a few people around the world are getting into beekeeping, so that's awesome. Oh, yeah, thanks that for, is fantastic, fantastic. And thanks for reading our article. And thanks for writing it, Gary. That's awesome. You know, we all need all this information, and and uh, one of the beginners, you know, contacted me, as I say on our newsletter, that um, on the right-hand side of our front page on our website, there's a word cloud there, and you click on any of those words there, and you'll get heaps of information, people. So... Uh, Oh, yeah, the word cloud. don't forget the word cloud. That's right. Easy access to any information that uh, you may be looking for help on. Absolutely, or you can do the, there's a search box at the top, and yeah, there's a category box, you can, lots of information, there's over over 400 blog posts at the moment. Wow, we have and been rising. busy. Jeez Louise. <laughs> well, we've been, we've been doing that blog for about four five or five years. years. Yeah, we're coming up to f- over five years now in our beekeeping adventures. And uh, it's been fun and, and, you know, I think that the work that we do, we, we just, you know, have so much comments coming back from that about how helpful it is and they can't believe it's all for free. So... You know, we love doing it, so keep listening. That's right. And we've even got a nice donation button on there, there now. Oh, see? yeah, a new product now. See, see, we asked me for something, Dale, and I got it there for you. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so if you feel like donating, there's a donation button on the right-hand side. That'd be great. Yeah, sometimes you might be uh, interested in beekeeping, but, you know, you don't necessarily want to or can't keep bees for whatever reason. If you want to support us, you can just click on that donation button and you can put whatever amount you want in there and um, you will happily receive it. So, um, And you can help us with our work that we're doing. That's awesome. Yep, fantastic. And the third most popular blog post was Tom Fearbold, beekeeper slash campaigner, and he's um, from Colorado. And Tom's a long-time campaigner against neonicotinoids, so it's a, it was a very... Different contrast from Randy Oliver, wasn't it? And a few people yep. made that comment to me, like Tyson from LA did made a comment like that. And, it, and I think Tom was it was a great it was a great talk. It's um, quite what's the word? Quite alarming. And I think it's important that everyone gets to know that information. So if you know anybody that's not a beekeeper and has a garden and buys chemicals, then maybe you should get them to listen to that. Yeah, because maybe spending an hour in the garden instead of three three seconds spraying something that will cause long term effects might just be the way to go. But I mean, even beekeepers have in their home they have a lot of insecticide sprays for bugs and stuff. So just be careful about your use with that because if you if your beekeeping stuff, which you shouldn't really keep in the house, gets covered with that, you're taking that uh, insecticide into your apiary. So just be aware of that, guys. The interesting thing about Tom is that he's been on some high-profile movies, hasn't he? He has. He's been on Vanishing the Bees. And he's also, was he, I think he was on Queen of the Sun as well, wasn't he? I think so. And uh, he's been on 60 Minutes. Yeah, he's he's definitely a long term um, beekeeper, and you know we just we just admire you know his uh, desire for the world being healthy and um, keeping bees and yeah some of the things that he's dealing with have been you can tell that they have you know causing him great concern. Absolutely, and he's almost at 40 years in beekeeping, so he's, he's been doing it a long time, so it's good. Yeah, that's interesting because one of the things that we find out when we talk to older beekeepers, the difference between when they first started to what they, you know, do today, and, you know, it seems to me in beekeeping we're always learning, we're always being affected by the seasons, the weather, you know, nature, everything like that, and um, I love it. It's it's exciting and fun and interesting, and you meet awesome people. We've just met so many wonderful people, and yeah, it's just it's just great. So, even if you're not a beekeeper now, get into it, man. 
Yep, that's for sure. Let's move on to beekeeping news. Kiwimana, beekeeping news. News you can use. Live from Kiwimana HQ, West Auckland, New Zealand. <laughs> right here, right now. Real, what is it? Real content, real Kiwis, real local. Oh, and international. <laughs> international news. First article is from Miriam Heenum, is it? Heenum? And she was the director of Vanishing of the Bees, so she's probably met Tom. Anyway, that's relating back to the last story, but she's written an article called Three Products, Three Bee Products You Should Use Every Day. And this has got some good uh, um, good ideas in it, eh? You can use uh, raw jelly, raw honey. And what was the third one? Do propolis. you remember? I can't remember. Was it propolis? I don't propolis, yeah. Okay. So I think her name's Miriam Hanine. Yep. And I think that this is interesting, and it's... You know, products that come from the hive, I mean, the thing to be aware is that if you're taking stuff from your colony, it means that you're taking a resource out of your colony. So it's it's good to have these products and use them, but also remember that those are the things that the bees use to survive. So... Um, just remember, give to the bees first, and then any excess, go from there. But first the bees need it before you do, and then go from there. Absolutely, except for honey, because I need it for my tea. <laughs> honey, including you, mister. Because okay. the bees need their own food. I mean, I know. We need we're it. going to talk about another story about plants and bees and what's been going on over time. So I think it's a real wake-up call if we don't uh, listen to these things because nature and bees and beekeeping, they all are connected, gardens, flowers, trees, the whole thing. So, um, yes, there are are products you can use, but just remember, give to your bees first before you take so much off that they've they fail in some way because you've taken their resources off them. Well, that's right. You don't take all their honey. No. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, that's a anyway, uh, uh, rant over. Let's move on. More products. <laughs> Moving on. A, a recent study in the Netherlands. It's more problems for bees. We've wiped out their favourite plants. And this is a study done in the Netherlands. Concluded that the loss of preferred host plants is one of the main factors responsible for wild bee decline. And the Netherlands was picked because it's one of the most human-modified and intensively farmed countries in the world. Yeah, I believe it. You know, I I believe it. I mean, if you're talking about monocultures, monocultures in themselves, you know, in America have wiped down huge amounts of uh, resources for the bees. So... You know, we might see it as a flower or whatever, but if you get rid of three different types of flowers, then, you know, it's looked like you only got one food source. So it's interesting that they've done a study that proves that. Yeah, well, what they did is they got some old bee bodies from the 1950s. They must have had them stored in a museum or something, and they, they tested the pollen that those bees were eating at that time. And the Amazing. pollen, you yeah, know, the, the pollen that they were eating at that time doesn't exist anymore. Those plants have either been, been, you know, got rid of or wiped out or replaced with some other kind of agriculture. So That's interesting. And do you know... Yeah, it is interesting. I think people should have read this. It's quite good. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing too, that if, if the bees are doing that, do they just sit back and say, oh, no, we haven't got this food, we're going to die? They don't do that. They go out and they find and use new resources. So it's like that here in New Zealand when the bees first came over, eh? Same thing. They would have come from um, England and had certain food sources here and then come to New Zealand and thought, oh, my God, what are we going to eat, you know? And they've modified their their foraging on the Kanukas and Manukas and look what they're producing. Awesome stuff, which is so beneficial. Yep, beneficial. So this is an interesting article. I, I quite like this one. We'll, uh... 
It's got a lot of information in there that um, just shows you how the bees have adapted too. Yep, indeed. And is it a good thing they've adapted? We don't know. That could be why the, a lot of the wild bees have, are gone, because they can't adapt. Yeah, they just have failed. And uh, Sad. Yeah, so moving right along. Move Gary. along. Unfortunately, another, well, this is kind of not sad, but positive. Anyway, the, more beekeepers in Canada have joined the neo Nick lawsuit. Go Canada! <laughs> no, no singing, no singing. What? The the Alberta Beekeepers Commission doesn't support this lawsuit apparently, but there's these uh, there's two apres have started a lawsuit and litigation against Bayer and Syngenta, and the the lawyers are trying to urge other beekeepers to get involved as well, and it sounds like a good idea, eh? They're not um, it's only damages only or something, and they're gonna that's gonna be starting probably this year the trial. So, good luck, guys. Yeah, I think this is great. I think it is time that we beekeepers start letting the authorities know that what these companies are doing is harming our natural world, harming our health and our our people and the insects, you know. And it was interesting that, sorry to go back to Tom Theobald, he talked about travelling, you know, going on a trip and the insects that would get killed basically on a trip but he said that you know he noticed that when he went on a trip recently that there was hardly any insects on his car so that's a really really simple way to see how how the world's being harmed and and I think these companies need to understand what is happening and what you know what they're doing and we need variety in our food just like the bees do and all the other pollinators we need it if you kill one part of that food chain you know you're screwing with the rest of them absolutely oh, so, so i went off on a tangent you did go off a tangent oh, so yeah these guys are myself. these guys are trying to uh, fight against neonicotinoids and they had some massive losses didn't they in ontario last season so terrible, let's hope just this terrible. it doesn't happen again for you guys yeah we wish you all the best in that guys and um yeah keep up the good fight absolutely and yeah it's any the next one is the many health benefits of kanuka honey you know what i'd like to hear a little interlude of our native tui bird No, oh, that was just beautiful. Beautiful. It was great. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And, and that's what I hear in the morning, just before the sun comes up. And it's just awesome. And then one one of them sings. And then a bit further down the valley, the next one sings. And then there's one further around the valley. And that one sings. It's like they do a chorus each. And then it goes right around the valley, so it's just awesome. Yeah, we should try and... Uh, That's the native Tui. Record that maybe one day, but I don't think we'll do it justice. No, I don't think so. That was pretty cool. Yep. Anyway, this next story is many health benefits of Kanuka honey, and... We already knew that. I know, but the whole world's getting to know about it now. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. I mean, where we are, we mainly have kanuka. And um, when I burnt my leg, I used the kanuka honey for uh, my wound. And it was a pretty severe burn. And the kanuka has just healed it. And it's just awesome. Yep. And I'm thinking that maybe it'll become as popular as manuka one day. I agree. I agree. And they're talking that on this article about... You know that the family should load up on this, and and it's raw, and it's raw, and natural state, unprocessed, straight, basically from the hive is what you want. Absolutely, it's fantastic. Are you all right there? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. So, <laughs> so many health <laughs> benefits. <laughs> the next one: thoughts on beekeeping and mental health. Oh yeah. <laughs> Okay. Some people think we are mad because we hang out with bees all day. Emily from London asks, are they good for your mental health? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Emily. Uh, That is it. Uh, They are such great listeners. 
<laughs> they also will tell you when they've had enough. They'll also come and look at you. I love it when we open the hive and start working the hive just nice and calmly and they all look over the top of the frames at me just to say, oh, that's Margaret. They do. And you can tell them all your problems, can't you? They are awesome listeners. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic. So yep. uh, my view is, yes, and we are all mad. All beekeepers are mad and be proud of it. That's right. And this weekend we've got some social occasions with beekeepers. So that's going to be interesting. I wonder what we'll talk about. <laughs> luckily, luckily, one of them in the middle is, isn't beekeepers. Yeah, D- that's at um, 65, isn't it? I think so. Not 64. No. <laughs> so that was a great article, Emily. I appreciate that. And uh, everyone can check it out and make yeah. it make a comment because there's been a lot of comments on that. Yeah, I think it definitely is one of the popular ones. Um, and I believe that, you know, beekeeping is good for your health. Absolutely. And the next one is artwork with a buzz. Or artwork with buzz. Oh, yeah, this is this is local. This is in Auckland City, and in one of our areas called Victoria Park. That's right. And this this I'll read you a bit from the article from the quote: "Next to a skate park and across the road from a bicycle shop, an artwork is on the move. The swarm rises from the hive. It swirls in a vortex, and then it decamps to the low lying branch of a nearby tree." 10,000 bees looking to start a new community. That, like a poem. You know, Sarah Smuts-Kennedy is beyond delighted. Later in a cafe across the road, she likened the swarm to a kinetic sculpture because while we see bees, she she sees art. Yeah, mm. I saw art when I um, We was... see art a lot during the swarming season then, don't we? Absolutely. I saw some art with a wasp nest that I was asked to remove because they thought it was a bee's nest. And when we looked at the actual big ball, it was like a um, basketball. It was huge, but it would look like artwork, very similar to the hornet thing. But I see what she means. I think nature is art in action. Absolutely, and these these are uh, six insula- in hives down on the, in the middle of the park, hey? So it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. Good luck. Yeah, it's going to be awesome to see how they go, and they're leaving all the, the pasture um, to grow, and you can see them standing in there. There's a lot of flowers and everything, so that's that sounds that's awesome. Absolutely, and the next one is a sad story from down the line, Alexandra. Alexandra. And terrible news for Elms Apries. Their honey house was destroyed by fire and it just, just after Christmas. Wow, and you could sad, imagine it? it, eh? It would just be horrific. And um, the the good thing is, is that no one was hurt. No, just 40 gallons, what was it? 40 gallon, 44 gallon drums went up in the blaze. So that's... That's be most of their. Uh, I would say that's a lot of their their uh, their stock this year, isn't it? Yeah, and of course there's equipment in there as well. I think they must be devastated, and I'm sad to hear that. Yeah, so sorry to hear that, guys. That's terrible news. I hope you guys have got some good insurance, and um, yeah, you guys can you know rise up from the ashes, as they say, and start again next season. And yeah. Terrible. Well, at least the honey flows on, so hopefully you'll build up again well, really quickly. Well, that's what he said in the article. Like he says, luckily all the bees were out, out and about, and he was in the truck he was driving in was okay. So Yeah, awesome. Well, we're thinking of you guys, and um, yeah, all the best in your recoveries. Absolutely. Let's move on to questions from you. Questions from you. This one's a funny one. How do I remove bees from my water feature? Signed, disgruntled in Auckland. I think you actually <laughs> took this phone call, didn't you? I tell you what, <laughs> we have had the most amazing phone calls the last couple of weeks about, basically in my view, it's all about nature just doing its thing and, and humans being annoyed about it. And I, I think, you know, this guy rang and he said that he's got bees um, drinking out of his water 
water feature. <gasps> Shock horror. I know. It's just amazing. Imagine a bee doing that. Anyway, I said, well, is there a cluster there? Because this is a swarm call. And he said, no, there's no cluster. They seem to be coming and going. And I said, oh, they must be thirsty. And you're actually saving the bees by letting them drink from your water. Oh, but they're dangerous. And my children are going to get hurt and injured. And and I just, you know, I just uh, Tim, say. Watch, you must have watched a swarm movie. Are we too disconnected from nature these days to understand that, you know, if it's dry and there's drought conditions that the bees will be, you know, going about their business and trying to get water. So I, I said to him, I said, you know, just explain to the children that the bees are thirsty and it's very dry and drought conditions at the moment and just advised him to say, you know, the kids just move slowly around them, don't swat them or run or scream and the bees should just go about their business and don't stand on them. Absolutely, and put some stones in there so they don't drown. Otherwise, we'll be coming over and telling you off. Yeah, that's right. Don't let our bees drown. He was told by Auckland Council when they rang, he said to me, and I quote from what he said to me, that just empty the water feature. Well, that would work. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Wasn't too impressed with that, though, by the sound of things. No, he wasn't impressed, but uh, that's the way it is. But, I mean, if you are a um, beekeeper, a good idea is to have a uh, some water for your bees just like go there instead of your neighbour's pool and stuff. But Absolutely, I, think, I yeah. agree. And the thing is, is at the moment it is exceptionally dry. I filled up the water tanks this morning, then I did it again about 2 o'clock. And then I know Gary went in and topped it up again because it's just so hot out there. Oh, they're going through like a bottle of Southern Comfort a day. <laughs> we're not, we don't, we don't, <laughs> I should explain that. Yes, I think you should. Our, our water feature thing that we use to, as, a, as a bottle, it's upside down and it slowly fills it up. And it's actually an old Southern Comfort bottle. Yeah, and people so. come over all the time and go, oh, does the honey taste like Southern Comfort? And I go, yes, <laughs> it does. Indeed. Yep. You can sell it for a premium amount. Yeah, anyway, so, we're, not, oh, we're not sponsored by them. The so. next question I got was um, today, actually, a guy rang up and he said, uh, I've got some bees that are going into the ground. Into the ground. Into the ground. And I'm painting nearby and I want them gone. I says, oh, have you had a look at them, you know? I said, because generally bees don't go into the ground. I said, that's probably more a wasp behavior. And I said, the, the wasps are more yellow and black rather than orange. And, and spindly and evil looking. Evil, evil. <laughs> exactly. Yes, anyway, yeah, lock up your children. Yeah, they're more of a Because they're very dangerous. But anyway, it was like trying to explain that... Um, they probably are, um, you know, they are probably wasps and to be very careful and he will probably need to get in a pest uh, controller in to sort them out. And then it was continually going on about, so, well, how will I know? I mean, what is yellow? And, and I thought, oh, my God, I couldn't, couldn't explain what yellow was. Yellow is yellow. If they're coming out of the ground, they're probably going to be wasps, aren't they? Yeah. So, um, I su- in New Zealand, anyway. I suggested to ring our local bee club and find someone closer to his area because he was on the other side of Auckland and go and have a look for him if he, he needed someone to determine whether they were bees or wasps. I said, it, you know, it really depends because these people are volunteers and uh, they do it at no charge, but, you know. Indeed. And this this reminds you of another story we just got in Hamilton, that this, the people in the street are complaining that the council are not mowing their verges, and they're causing it's causing health hazards. Apparently, it's attracting rats, stoats, and they use the word bees in the same sentence. I can't believe it! My God! Oh my God! People <sighs> are just not connected. The world is going crazy. You know these plants. I mean, look at this photo. This photo is beautiful. The bees. There's like beautiful tree um, flowers, and then later on, she they say, what do they say later on? They are lots of bees there. That's fantastic, and we can't even see the pond now. Oh, well, that's sad. And the particular spot, blah blah. blah they go, oh, and it's not great for local kids or adults. So that 
uh, for that matter, that are allergic to bee stings. Well, well uh, that's true, but yeah. it's you know you just got to live and let live. They don't. They're not going to sting you without you walking on them. Yeah, I think that that's the reality. That um, when a bee flies out of its hive and it sees a, a nicely mowing lawn, it's just like a barren wasteland to them. But if they fly out of their hive and they see a wildflower field, they're just going to go nuts. So the the bees are in our little wildflower area. The the bumblebees are just going crazy in there, and they just awesome i think they should be embracing what's going on but uh yeah at least it's not auckland transport who are just spraying the <laughs> oh pardon me <laughs> spraying the um verges crazily um i think i mentioned that last podcast yes, with yeah. the roundup yeah and they they've been ring barking trees so that the allegedly allegedly ring barking the trees um which are Willow, willow trees and pine trees. Well, we don't know if that was them. It could have been anybody. Well, that's true. I don't know, but it seems awfully suspicious that it's happened in an area where they were working not long ago. True. And it could be it could be in line with the new um, fast broadband that they want to put in around there. So, but anyway, it, 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 I have noticed a lot more spraying. That's going on. Yeah, we must need we need to do something about that because that's crazy. Crazy anyway, man, crazy. We will tell you more about that. Let's let's come up to blog posts coming soon. <laughs> blog posts coming soon. How to deal with a laying worker. That's an article I'm writing about how to deal with laying workers in a hive. And what, what have you yeah, got coming a, up? It's a real nuisance when you get them. That's for sure. I just. You know, I think that once you get a laying worker, it's a bit late, don't you? Um, I don't know. I think you can you can sort them out. I think you can. Just depends. Depends on what where it's at. I think that it's just an indication that the you haven't been checking that the hive is queen right. But I'm sure that the article will be full of lots of information to help people work through that one. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, aren't you the one writing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, oh. let's go to feedback from you. Have you had any feedback? Oh yeah, I've had quite a bit of feedback. I've had a feed had feedback from Jim. He was talking about um he's been listening to all our podcasts and he made some really positive comments that he's enjoyed the improvement in the quality of recording and uh, well done Gary. That's awesome. And it's made the podcast sound more professional, I suppose. Oh, that's good. Thank you, Jim, for that yeah, feedback. And he also said that he loves the consistent quality and the bit of fun that we have as well. So that's awesome. Awesome. And what about Gilbert? He talked um, the other day. He's quietly spoken and um, made the comment that he enjoyed the the comments from, I think it was Ingo Overseas, about having a drink every time I say yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was funny. That was a good one. And, yeah, the fun we've had. And getting the postcard is feedback in itself. And, you know, we're really thrilled when we hear from you. And every time someone joins the newsletter, we're getting their questions about how to deal with, you know, what's the purpose of a queen excluder, things like that. And... Um, talking about what's going on in their hives, and a lot of beginners are really searching for information out there. So, uh, my suggestion is is come along to one of my beekeeping courses. Absolutely, they're starting soon, aren't they? That's going to be good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting our new students. It's going to be great, and yeah, we're having a bit of a gathering of some of our last season uh, bee beginners. So that's awesome, and and they're all getting into their hives now. So. Awesome. Yeah, it's very exciting. And if you want to leave a review for us, you can go to kiwimanaco.nz slash iTunes if you're on iTunes because that really helps us. Helps us move up on the rankings. And we, as Margaret said, the newsletter is at kiwimanaco.nz slash sign up. So if you join our newsletter, we send out our weekly newsletter. With free. Tips. Free. Yep. Everything's free. Tips, tricks. Not everything. No, not everything. Tips, tricks, podcasts, they're all free. 
That's right. I mean, they're all for you and to help you. And uh, if there's things that you think we, we should be talking about, yeah, email us at info at kiwimana.co.nz and uh, yeah we'll love to hear you know what you think we should be covering it'd be awesome absolutely we appreciate all the emails and we are a bit behind in those so we're, we're slowly getting through them so keep uh, thanks for emailing us everyone it's great yeah. I think all... the reality is is that we've um, been sitting on the deck having a gin and tonic and uh, after a very very hot day out in the apiary um, in the middle of summer Indeed. Sorry, guys, over there in the winter states. <laughs> I know. Well, they're, they're moving into summer now, so it's yeah, good. Yeah, so um, we really are having a, 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 a summer that we've just been waiting for. It's just been absolutely gorgeous and uh, I'm very grateful for it. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, guys. And we'll uh, talk to you next month. See you, guys. Thanks for joining us again. And we'll talk to you next month. And we'll have some great interviews coming up for you, too. See ya. See ya. This week we are talking about neonicotin, neonic, <laughs> neonic lawsuit and beekeeping and mental health. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just take that again. No, let's do it. Just let's no, keep it no. It was terrible. It was heaps of fun. People will love it.